Shabbat Shalom. Welcome, Bruchim Abbaim. I'm Rabbi Paul, your virtual rabbi. You have found Beit Virtuelli. Let's stir up a little Torah together. And yes, that opening was not mere, mere pandering. I do intend to talk about puppies and figure out how to relate that to Torah. There is more than one reason we might hang on to a vision from childhood. If we're fortunate, we do this because our childhood echoes throughout our personal narrative as a time of protection, warmth, and caring. If we're not so fortunate, we have hopefully carried the lessons it takes to heal into a personal narrative of overcoming. Still, to ignore the wonder we see and experience as a child as something is touched for the first time is to remove ourselves slowly from the possibility of wonder itself. There is simply nothing quite like not only experiencing something for the first time, but having that experience without cynicism or having been programmed by others how I must experience that lest I be a bad person. Thank you, social media. I will go ahead and watch movies, television, and listen to music myself and make up my own mind. <clears throat> the problem with that wonder of childhood however, is when the truth of that moment is never allowed to expand outwards with the complexity that experience and knowledge bring. Your first puppy, for example, see what I did there, is an amazing and hopefully patient teacher if you had the wonderful gift and opportunity to have a puppy or a pet as a child. A child pulling at the tail of that puppy may get a gentle nip of education, but only because we have co-evolved now for tens of thousands of years with dogs, and they get us. Listen, I'm a cat person, but I have no illusions from within my preference. If we are still pulling that puppy's tail as an adult, however, well, the obvious hope is that the magical furry and tolerant playmate of our toddler years becomes a different sort of companion as we age, and that we as well become a different sort of companion for them. The magic of annual companions is that there is a place for co-creation at any age. But with age, experience, and education, the furry or hairless friend that comes into our house later in life ideally exists much more as a subject than an object. We not only teach consciously, we allow ourselves to be taught consciously. And the act of engaging in both elevates both us and our animal companions. Still, our first encounter with our first pet that was its own thing. That'll stay with us. I know it's a heavy-handed metaphor to shift this now to sacred texts, but I simply must. Just as it takes a lot of effort to engage in the relational process of training an animal as an adult, it requires intentional activity to engage in religious texts as adults when we age. Told you it was heavy-handed. Stick with me. Intentional engagement is not how we begin our religious journeys. In one way or another, via Hollywood, picture books, religious school, or family traditions, we have for good or ill a first encounter with religion that predates our ability to process the information without needing to pull on a tail. We encounter Noah, for example, at a cognitive time when a big boat with all the animals not only makes sense, it kicks off pictures in our imaginations. Rational truth is not the goal when we're three. The part of this that's going to be hard for us to hear is that because of the nature of religion, we tend, surprise, surprise, not to do as much work to find an adult relationship with that big boat filled with animals as we do when it comes to human-animal relations. We freeze the boat in time either as an act of piety, it must be as it is written, or rejection. It is absurd, so everything else in the book must as well be absurd. Take, for instance, a simple passage in Parshat Tzav that will be looked at quite differently depending on how much Torah has been locked into our first encounter with it. In a passage detailing the mincha, or the meal offering, we read, And this is the ritual of the meal offering. Aaron's sons shall present it before the Eternal in front of the altar. A handful of choice flour and oil of the meal offering shall be taken from it, with all the frankincense that is on the meal offering, and this token portion shall be turned into smoke on the altar as a pleasing odor to the Eternal. A pleasing odor. Really. Am I the only one that has to suppress a picture of Robert Duvall hunkering down on the beach teaching his soldiers and opining? I love the smell of night palm in the morning. Yes, 
it's a disturbing image, but locking ourselves into an image of a god that walks, talks, zaps, and yes, smells is going to cause an unending line of such images. This is a point that cannot be ignored. If the anthropomorphic, the giving of human attributes, portrayal of God that exists in the surface text of our sacred texts is meant to be taken literally, then the only possible way we have of comprehending this is via comparison. If we read about God talking, we hear, we imagine a human voice rather than expand out to the contemplation of listening to the wind or our instincts. And don't get me started on the voices that pop into my mind unbidden. I do not want to hear certain voices as the voice of the Eternal. Good morning, baby! As if that were possible. Bueller? Bueller? Others, I guess, would be okay. Oh, I know quite a lot about you, Bruce. Just about everything there is to know. Moving on. If we read about the outstretched and mighty hand of God, then we think about human power. Even if our personal experience of this places us in memories we'd rather avoid. We do not think of the strength of nature or the inevitability of human advancement, all legit interpretations of Yad HaChazaka. And yes, if we read about a god smelling something, the first image that pops up might just be one that the writers of Torah would prefer not to be the first image that pops up. Oh my god, what is that smell? Now, the reality is, encountering Torah as we gain experience beyond childhood takes three kinds of work, three steps, if you will. What would seem like the first is the act of engaging with the thousands of years of wisdom and commentary on such things as reach nichoach, that sweet and pleasant smell that is so oft mentioned in the Tanakh. That is actually the third step, however, as the first two are one, becoming conscious of how locked in we are to our initial encounters with the sacred, even if they go all the way back to childhood, which is followed by, two, it mattering that the writers and editors of our sacred texts most likely did not have our childhood understanding in mind when those texts were written or inspired. Only after one and two are thoroughly dealt with will come any attempt or any desire, quite frankly, to encounter these stories or poetry or laws or rituals with the complete faculties of our brain. And what is for me the most interesting part of this is that this lock happens to all of us and then simply manifests differently based on our perspective, running more in the direction of orthodoxy or fundamentalism to liberal or secular. All of us are in dialogue with the childhood encounter. It's just that the pathway leading from childhood paints a different color on the do not touch label with which we seal these sacred monuments from the past. I had a fascinating encounter in a shiur many years ago in a reformed community. What makes this incident stay with me for so long was the unique background of the person of blessed memory with whom I interacted. The person in question, truly a fascinating and kind human with incredible education and honestly quite a bit of success that came from that education, had come originally from an orthodox background but moved through marriage in the direction of reform. None of this is bad, none of this is pejorative. However, once there in reform, he believed that he had an excuse to reject the text that he had felt childish as a child, but was surrounded by institutions that did not help him reconcile these thoughts later and in life. After at some point encountering a dialogue with Judaism that called into question the historicity of these texts, he was able to wash his hands of them as the silly childhood stories he needed them to be, as he had chosen a mostly non-religious life from the perspective of his childhood. I proved a bit of a challenge for him as one who teaches that there is no contradiction to living a deeply religious life, finding religious texts to be essential, and using every scientific tool available to analyze those texts and the tradition that comes from them. To his credit, he showed up for years at every class I taught. To describe why I remained forever such a challenge to him, I offer the hypothesis that he was engaging in step three looking for interpretive sources, without having first done the work of steps one and two, realizing the locks from our childhood and then acknowledging that this matters. The particular shiur in question involved me teaching about the Pardes model of hermeneutics in Judaism, lots of examples on this channel, that we can look at sacred texts from the perspective of a clear meaning, a meaning that can be teased out via special relational tools, a, a meaning that can be found through allegory, and a meaning in the wordless mists of mysticism where all is bound together, just one heartbeat on the other side of what consciousness can grasp. 
To do this, in Shi'urim, I will often take a text from the Torah and take it through these four modalities. After doing this several times, our person in question with a look of grave concern raised his hand and said rather forcefully, but that's all just sophistry. I don't even need to translate what he meant, as over the next few minutes of dialogue he was able to express exactly what brought him to this exclamation. You, Rabbi, know that the stories in the Torah are just stories, yet you make your living by using these stories. So in order to justify your career, you need to take modern tools of literary criticism and turn them backward in order to make our mythology acceptable for a contemporary audience. How could you possibly think that this is what the writers of the Torah meant? It's all sophistry. Thinking back on this always makes me a bit sad for this gift in mind behind this argument and the joy in his own religion that he probably never had. It makes me even more sad, as if I get a negative comment on one of my stirring Torah videos, it often comes from a similar place with mild variations of flavor. The kindest goes something like, I disagree with your interpretation, which by the way is awesome and wonderful and more of that. That's Judaism. We should disagree about our interpretations as long as it is respectful and done for the purpose of elevation. The opposite extreme falls more into the how dare you world. These come as plays on God wrote Torah, so you don't have the right to interpret it. I get it. Torah says God spoke. It's right there in the plain English of the original text. Who am I to suggest that this is a metaphor for something much more interesting? And yeah, enough of that sophistry. Something really interesting does happen. However, with just a few seconds of assuming that folks in the past might have had both smarts and sophistication every once in a while, those folks in the past also had to think their brilliant thoughts without the tools we have, such as being able to search for Hebrew words on a web page and see every time that combination appears across a thousand years of texts. In our passage in Parshat Tzav, there's not a whole lot of discussion on the meaning of reach nichoach, that sweet and pleasing smell to the eternal, but only because that discussion has already happened in the other places, the many places that same phrase has been used. Going back to Noah and his cool boat with lots of animals, we get to find that Noah makes a sacrifice of gratitude at the end of the flood, and a nearly identical sweet and pleasing smell to the eternal phrase is used. But don't forget, interpretation is all sophistry and not something done in the past. It's just a modern tool, so we can ignore the words of the Radak. Rabbi David Kimhi, a late 12th and early 13th century philosopher and commentator, who explains, Reach nichoach with Dibra Torah Kalishon Bnei Adam. Torah speaks to us in the everyday language of human beings. He continues, This facilitates our understanding of God's reaction, seeing that God has no nose and cannot smell in the accepted sense of the word. Emphasis added by the rabbi, most certainly not making up his interpretation tools for the sake of sophistry. I stand on the back of giants. When in Psalm 50.13, the psalmist speaks of God asking if he would eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats, this is also a figure of speech, of course. Emphasis again added. David most certainly did not suggest that such a thing were possible in the literal meaning of the words. The meaning of such phrases is that the offerings were pleasing to God as if, if we had been speaking of human beings, they smelled good and tasted good. I'm still going to argue with the Radak regarding some of his conclusions, but this is where I hope we all look at each other in the eyes, whether Orthodox, Reform, Conservative, Secular, a variation or offshoot of any of these, or even coming from outside the interpretive tradition of Judaism and acknowledge that our knowledge not being exposed to other ways of analyzing and interpreting does not make them invalid. How much more so if they make us uncomfortable? If the narrative deity presented in Torah in our minds must have a literal voice, hands back, and the human ability to smell, then from within our tradition, how do we reconcile that not just the Radak, but literally hundreds of commentators over thousands of years have engaged in interpretation based on symbol and metaphor and allegory and mysticism in addition to the literal potentials. How do we deal with the fact that Torah itself on its very surface does this? In the real world that Torah tries hard to reflect from within its specific theological framework, we experience a gamut of emotions resulting from our actions. Yes, that may seem obvious, but unless we have a specific pathology such as narcissism, Doing the right thing, I'll go ahead and define that as lifting up instead of tearing down, gives a sense of warmth and goodness and even wellness. 
When so much of our lives involves numbing ourselves so that we can move forward with everyday necessity, the sun coming through those clouds of numbness can even feel divine. Being humans with the same functioning brains and senses of those of us gifted to be living today, the writers of Torah would have understood, as we do, that when one of these beneficent memories from the past embraces us and brings us back to that near mystical moment, that the gateway to that memory was most likely olfactory. Our sense of smell dissolves time and space and the stray molecules tied to memories past places us not kind of there, but for a moment there. What better way to help us understand within our sacred texts than an action is worthy of elevation within a specific religious tradition than evoking our sense of smell? Of course, pleasing to the eternal is described as reach nichoach. It's a way, a turn of phrase in everyday language that leads us to a deeper understanding if we let it. As the iterative question has already been asked in the series of videos, you can find that stirring Torah below, of if we are basing our strong emotions regarding religion on our first encounter from childhood, the next question that comes, if we've been able to honestly challenge ourselves with the first, is if we are aware of how we react to others with interpretations that differ from ours. If coming from a different tradition regarding the sacred texts and traditions of Judaism, are you going to allow another religion to explore their relationship, our relationship with the eternal through our own language, ritual, and interpretive tradition? Or do we have to comply with yours? Is resistance futile? You will be assimilated. Resistance is futile. Is there any history we wish to look into when one group demands that another group, how much more so a tiny group numerically, understand their relationship with the divine exactly as you do? Would you appreciate the same leveled at you? For those of us within the big tent of Judaism, is our religion one of fiat, where all follow a supreme religious leader? Or has our religion classically included debate? Like, you know, going back to Abraham, arguing with God. Like, you know, that only about 50% of the posed questions in the Talmud have a clear and definitive answer, and the rest is mechloket l'shem hashemaim, the capturing of debate for the sake of heaven. Disagreement is great, beautiful, also, sure, occasionally quite strenuous and humbling. Shutting someone down, however, because we don't like that someone's interpretation doesn't match with ours at a gut level on first hearing, well, something about that just doesn't smell quite Right. Shabbat shalom. We'll see you next time. Tevet yosheva Nerot yim chabucha Yachat harim yeraneinu Lifne Adonai Kiva lishpot ha'aretz Yishpot Tevel, Tevel, Tzedek, Ve'am